um, for sticking around. I know it's well into your lunch hour by now, and I really appreciate that you took the time to listen to uh, one more presentation today. Ah, uh, yeah, I looked at the calendar. I know there's no one uh, slotted behind me. Uh, my name is Bruno Reisman. Um, I'm originally from Holland. I'm based out of the US now. I am the architect for software defined networking at uh, Juniper Networks. And the topic of my presentation today, once I get it up on the screen, is going to be Open Contrail. Open Contrail is a network virtualization platform. Uh, it's open source. Um, it is built and supported by Juniper. And one thing that you will notice um, is that in very many ways, Open Contrail is quite similar to the previous presentation, the NYSERA NSX product. Um, the main difference being um, that we decided to open source everything. Just to give you uh, a little bit of history behind Open Contrail, Juniper Networks, of course, is best known for its physical hardware, uh, physical routers, physical switches, physical security gateways. And about nine months ago, we acquired a company called Contrail Systems that has a network virtualization solution that is aimed at the open source um, stack, uh, including uh, cloud stack and also open stack. Then in, um, on September 16, we announced the first product that came out of that acquisition, which is what I'll talk about today, uh, which is called Contrail. And at the same time, we made a decision that raised a few eyebrows in the industry, which is we decided to open source everything. The, the, the V router, which is our equivalent of the V switch, the forwarding plane, as well as the SDN controller that sits on top of it. Uh, there is, of course, also a commercial product that you can get from Juniper or some of our partners. It's the identical same product. Literally the same checksum on the binary image. The only difference between the commercial and the open source product is that you get support from Juniper or one of our partners. Before I go into the details of what open control is, how it works from a technology. I'm going to spend a few slides explaining what we mean when we say uh, network virtualization. The very first thing is that within a cloud or within a virtualized data center, network virtualization means being able to give each tenant uh, the illusion of having a logically separa separated network that is isolated from all of the other tenants in the cloud. Okay, in a public cloud, a tenant is literally a customer of the cloud. In a, uh, a private um, cloud, uh, a tenant is typically a department within the organization or maybe a separate virtual network that you put all your vending machines on so that to keep it separate from everything else. These virtual networks sit on top of a physical network in very much the same way that a virtual machine sits on top of a physical server. And these virtual networks, um, in the case of Open Contrail, can be layer two segments, or they can be layer three networks, or as we'll see in a couple of slides, they can be more complicated arrangements where you have multiple layer two segments connected by security policies. Uh, if you're familiar with virtual private clouds in Amazon, it's, it's very, the concept is very similar to that. We actually don't create these virtual networks using VLANs. Uh, in, in a way very similar to the previous speaker, we actually also create these virtual networks using overlays. Uh, there's a lot of scaling and stability and complexity issues that are related um, to implementing virtual networks with VLANs. It's fine to use VLANs at small scale deployments, but when you got, once you get to very large scale deployments, VLANs simply don't cut it. 
Some, of, some examples of why VLANs don't work as well as overlays is the amount of state that you need in your physical network. If you implement a virtual network in a data center using a VLAN, it implies that every time you add a tenant to a network, you have to touch all of your physical networks, all, the, all of your physical switches, and all of those physical switches will end up with every MAC address of every virtual machine in your network. Another example is, uh, has to do with things like spanning tree. Uh, in order to, to avoid loops in your network, you have to turn on, turn on spanning tree. If you turn on spanning tree, you don't efficiently use all of the paths in your network. You can't do multipath very effectively. You cannot get around that with various technologies, but then your network becomes very, very complicated very quickly. So by using overlays, implementing these virtual networks becomes much more simple. The second piece of functionality that Open Control provides in terms of network virtualization is the ability to apply policies at the boundaries of these virtual networks at a very high level of abstraction. What you can do is you can say, I want to apply a security policy between this green virtual network for the green tenant and that red virtual network for the red tenant. Okay? If I had not done that, then because they're separate virtual networks, they're separate closed groups, and they would not be able to communicate with each other. So what I can do is I can apply a security policy that essentially says I want to make an exception. I want to allow this green VM to communicate with that red VM, but subject to a particular security policy. And that security policy might be something like I only want to allow HTTP traffic and when the traffic goes from the red to the green VM, then I want to apply network address translation. Okay. With these two particular examples, stateless firewall filters, or ACLs, and NAT, those types of simple functionality can be provided in the vSwitches themselves. Once you get to more complicated for, uh, pieces of policy, between virtual networks, um, you need a more sophisticated concept which is called service chaining. Okay? It's simply a more sophisticated or more complex version of a policy between virtual networks where you apply um, more sophisticated services to the traffic that flows between one virtual network and another virtual network. In this particular example, I might say, the green virtual network is allowed to talk to the red virtual network and I want to only allow HTTP, and, and I want to apply NAT, same as before. But now I also want to apply um, maybe stateful firewall, or deep packet inspection, or content caching. And in order to implement those higher level, layer four to layer seven types of services, you need to insert service appliances um, and apply that traffic, force the traffic to go through those service appliances. Those service appliances could be virtual service appliances. They could be virtual machines that host a virtual firewall. Um, there's a number of companies, including Juniper, that provide uh, virtual, firewall, virtual firewalls that are running in virtual machines. In the case of Juniper, it's a virtual version of our X firewall. That product is called Firefly, but there's similar products from other companies as well. Or you might want to deploy services in this service chain by putting physical appliances in that service chain. You might want to put a physical firewall in the chain, maybe because you need it for performance reasons or for some other reasons. So the way that we do service chaining will allow you to have a mixture of virtual and physical um, services in a service chain like that. One final observation on this slide. Um, once you start deploying virtual services, you will also need scale-out. Okay. Physical appliances tend to be implemented with ASICs and tend to have extremely high performance. Virtual appliances tend to have lower performance, and when you need more capacity um, than a single virtual machine image can provide, um, you need scale-out. You need to instantiate multiple parallel instances of such a virtual machine 
and load balance the traffic across it. So that's another feature that's built into this service chaining concept. The third thing that you need for virtual networking is the ability to connect different virtual networks in different locations across a wide area network. At the bottom, here I have two instances of a private cloud in two different data centers for some company, and they might want to do DCI, or data center interconnect. They might want to connect the red virtual network in the bottom left to the red virtual network in the bottom right, and the green virtual network on the bottom left to the green virtual network on the bottom right, etc. Or you might want to connect a virtual network in a private cloud with a virtual network um, that's provided as a virtual private cloud service by some public cloud provider, um, such as, for example, Amazon. Typically, what many customers, customers of ours do, enter large enterprises, they, they build a private cloud for the norm, for the typical capacity, and then they burst out into a public cloud for the peak capacity around Christmas, for example. And so once again, I need to be able to connect a virtual network within my private data center to the corresponding virtual network for me in the public cloud. The way that we at OpenContrail have implemented our virtual network technology is actually based on um, a technology that's very widely deployed in operator networks in the internet today, which is called MPLS Layer 3 VPNs. Okay. Even before Juniper bought Open Contrail or Contrail, um, this 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 has always been one of um, this has been the bread and butter of Juniper networks. This is one of the things that um, that many of our customers use. We have deployed literally tens of thousands of MPLS Layer Three VPNs, where some of the largest VPNs contain thousands or tens of thousands of um, PE routers and have millions of routes in their forwarding tables. This, this is exactly what we're good at. The people who founded Contrail came from Juniper and similar companies, understand that technology, then they spent some time at Google, learned how to build really scale outs as the end controllers, and combined those two pieces of technology to implement the, the Contrail technology that I'll get into uh, in more detail in a second. As a result of that, as a result of the fact that our internal virtual network technology is based on the same technology as those MPLS Layer 3 VPNs, it's actually very easy for us to do that wide area uh, interconnect. It's very easy for us to connect virtual networks within a data center to Layer 3 VPNs within a wide area network to connect data centers together or to connect a private cloud to a public cloud. And then we're able to provide things like traffic engineering and quality of service uh, across the wide area network in a tenant aware way. So those are the um, different use cases, the different applications of Open Contrail. I'm going to rewind and revisit every single one of them and explain how they're actually implemented under the hood. And a lot of this will, will, should be quite familiar after uh, what you've seen before this. Let me start with explaining how virtual networks are implemented. Um, on the left-hand side, you see, you see the logical diagram. This is what we're trying to build. On the right-hand side, you see the physical implementation of it. At the top, you have your cloud management system. Uh, this would be either CloudStack or OpenStack. Then below that, you have the Contrail controller, which is an SDN controller that is responsible for the networking aspects of the virtualization. And then at, below that, on the left and the right, you have two virtualized servers, uh, each with a couple of VMs. Then that horizontal line um, shows the boundary with the hypervisor, and that white, uh, thing, in, that white thing in the bottom is uh, what we call a V-router, but what most other people in the industry call a V-switch. Uh, we like to call it a V-router because the, the Contrail V-router doesn't just do layer two overlays, but layer three overlays as well. When you want to create one of these virtual networks, uh, you go to the northbound uh, API or through the graphical user interface of CloudStack and you ask it to create a virtual network. Then you ask it to instantiate a number of virtual machines and attach those virtual machines to the virtual network. 
Uh, CloudStack is responsible for creating the virtual machine, uh, for managing the life cycle of the virtual machine itself. Then it delegates the responsibility of creating the virtual network and attaching the virtual machines to the virtual network to Contrail, Open Contrail. What Contrail does is a couple of things. Let's say that we first create that red virtual machine on the bottom left. Contrail is told by CloudStack, I just created a virtual machine on this particular server and it needs to be attached to the red virtual network. The Contrail controller realizes this is the first red virtual machine on this particular server. So I'm going to need a separate routing table, which we call a routing instance, on that particular vRouter to separate, to create a separate routing table for that virtual network. That's that little red circle in the white vRouter. A similar thing happens on the other side. It, the VM, the first VM is put there for the red virtual network. We create another routing instance there. And then finally, Contrail, the Contrail controller realizes, oh, wait a minute, I have a red virtual machine over here, and I have another red virtual machine over there, and they're both attached to the red virtual network, so they need to be able to talk to each other. In order to achieve that, it creates that overlay tunnel, that gray tunnel from vRouter to vRouter, which, uh, once again, we also are not religious about what the encapsulation is. We support MPLS over GRE, we support MPLS over UDP, we uh, support VXLAN. The forwarding plane um, takes the packet that comes from the virtual machine, gives it to the vRouter, which does a lookup in the routing instance, realizes that the destination is over there on the other side of the network, encapsulates the packet, sends it across a tunnel to the other VM on the other side. What that means is that the physical switches, the underlay as we call it, that sit between the physical servers are just forwarding packets based on the source and destination IP address of the physical servers. Okay? There's no state at all per tenant in the physical underlay. There's no MAC addresses, no IP addresses of VMs anywhere. In fact, the only thing that's required of the physical network is that it can forward IP packets from server to server, which means it can be any switch from any vendor, even if it's not from Juniper. That's how we implement the basic virtu network virtualization. Poli Excuse me, did I? Yeah. To implement um, policies and service chaining, um, the workflow works as follows. You go to the northbound uh, interface and you express your policy. You say, I want this green virtual network to be able to talk to that red virtual network, but subject to the following policy constraint. Only HTTP, I want to do NAT, and I want the traffic to be forced through a virtual load balancer and a virtual firewall that are running in virtual machines at the bottom of this diagram. What Contrail will realize is that the red virtual machine and the green virtual machine need to be able to talk to each other. There needs to be a route in the routing instance from the green virtual machine that gets the traffic to the red virtual machine. However, that route should not take the shortest path, the direct path from red to green. That route should force the traffic to take a detour to visit those two particular virtual machines, that virtual load balancer and that virtual firewall, so that the traffic can be processed as it goes from green to red. In order to achieve that, the very first thing that you need to do is to obviously instantiate the virtual machines that host the virtual firewall and the virtual load balancer. And just like a real firewall or just like a real load balancer, these virtual load balancers and virtual firewalls will have multiple interfaces, inside interfaces and outside interfaces. And then I glue everything together by putting one interface in one virtual network and the other interface in another virtual network. And if you pay very close attention to the slide, you will notice that between the load balancer and between the firewall on the left-hand side, I put a little yellow helper network to glue two steps together. And then what Contrail does, it creates all the right routing tables and all the right tunnels in all the right places, as shown on the right-hand side of this diagram, so that the traffic is forced through the right sequence of virtual machines. Okay. 
This diagram on the right-hand side is, give, might give you the impression that it's rather simple, but I've oversimplified things quite a bit. In real life, there are going to be many green VMs and many red VMs. And so that forcing of traffic from all the right places to all the other right places will involve many routing instances and many tunnels and manipulating many different things. The other oversimplification that I've made is that I've only shown one virtual firewall. In real life, there could be multiple instances of this virtual firewall for scale outs. And if that happens, you need to have load balancing from step X to step X plus one in your service chain. And that's why that little glue, that little yellow helper virtual network really needs to be a multi-point to multi-point virtual network so that we can spray the traffic across the multiple steps in the service chain. Then the last use case is connecting um, virtual networks to physical networks. Um, at the top of this, on the left-hand diagram, uh, I, I showed a logical picture. I want to have a virtual network within a data center that is connected to a physical network on the outside world. That might be an MPLS layer 3 VPN, for example. On the right-hand side, I show you the, the physical implementation of it. At the top, we have what we've seen before, a virtual network within a data center, a couple of V routers with routing instances connected by a tunnel. And at the bottom, I have a very traditional layer 3 VPN, PE routers, CE routers with customer sites, and an MPLS LSP to glue everything together. In order to connect that layer 3 VPN to my virtual network, I need to have a gateway router at the edge of the network. That gateway router, in the case of Juniper, would be an MX router. What it needs to do is it needs to speak all of the MPLS layer 3 VPN protocols towards the bottom, which is BGP and LSPs for uh, MPLS LSPs. And at the top, it needs to speak whatever protocols it needs to speak to be able to connect into this virtual network. What we have done to make that very easy and straightforward is given the Contrail controller the ability to speak BGP to these gateway routers. Okay. Because the contract controller can speak BGP to the gateway routers, you can take any router from that you bought in the past 10 years to be that gateway function. Every single router in the world that supports MPLS layer 3 VPNs can speak BGP to the contract controller. In the data plane, what you need to be able to participate in the virtual network is support MPLS over GRE. Historical accident, every single router that was built in the past 10 years also supports that. And the reason is that if you rewind 20 years when MPLS was deployed and when it was still a very young technology, there were some operators that liked layer 3 VPNs but didn't like traffic engineering. And so in order to support those operators, Juniper and every single other uh, major router vendor supports MPLS VPNs with GRE as the encapsulation. So the way we do this integration is done in such a way that we only use standard protocols and that we interoperate with existing networking equipment that's already out there. Once you have that gateway functionality, you can build something like this. You can create a virtual network in one cloud, another virtual network in another cloud, and glue them together with MPLS layer 3 VPNs and do things like traffic engineering in your wide area network. That's a variation of that same technology also allows us to uh, connect bare metal servers or non-virtualized servers to a virtual network in a data center. Okay, there's many ways that you can do that. Um, one of those ways is shown here. What you can do is um, you take your bare metal server, uh, you take an ethernet or a VLAN, up, and then you use a gateway to connect that non-virtualized server to the virtual network in your data center. That gateway could be a software gateway. This is something that was discussed in the previous uh, discussion. Or it can be a hardware gateway. Um, it could be the top of rack switch that is sitting right there next to your server. So here, once again, we use existing technology that is already implemented on most um, high-end top of rack switches. The ability to create a routing instance to terminate that VLAN or Ethernet into, and then we use BGP to populate the routes into that routing instance. 
One of the important concepts of Contrail is that you configure the network at a very high level of abstraction. You say, I want these virtual networks, I want to apply these policies at the boundaries of my virtual networks, I want to connect this virtual network to that physical network, and then Contrail trans compiles that down to what actually needs to happen on a network. And internally, that's done by using this concept that we like to call SDN as a compiler. Internally within the Contrail controller, everything is built around formal data modeling. We have formal data models that describe the high-level service. And in that formal data model, we currently have things like a virtual network, a policy, a gateway function. And then you instantiate objects into that data model by using the northbound REST APIs that are automatically generated from the data model. Then we also have a low-level data model that describes the particular technology in the network. So for overlays, that means routing instances, tunnels, routes, gateways, that are route targets. Every time somebody changes something in the high-level data model, this thing in the middle, the transformation engine, wakes up and translates that high-level request into a de detailed description of what needs to happen in the network in the virtual network or in the physical network. And then we have multiple southbound protocols push the desired state to the network using BGP or XMP or other protocols. It's not just a matter of configuration, taking high-level concepts and breaking them down into smaller things. For operational state and analytics, it's also the other way around. Um, all of our vRouters in the hypervisor are, are constantly collecting events for every single flow in the network and sticking those events in a massively scalable um, database. And then we aggregate that and correlate that so that you can manage your network and troubleshoot it at the same level of abstraction as um, what you use on the management and uh, on the configuration side of things. Now you might be concerned that this SDN controller, that the Contra controller is a single point of failure or a bottleneck in your network. And the short answer is it isn't, because it's very carefully designed to be um, highly, availability and highly available and horizontally scalable. Even though it's a single logical system with a single management interface and a single pane of glass, it's actually internally implemented using um, different nodes. There are different nodes that provide different functions. We have the configuration nodes that contain the data models and the compiler. We have the uh, control nodes that contain the southbound protocols, such as XMPP and BGP. We have the analytics nodes that contain the analytics plane that I was talking about. Each one of these nodes can have multiple instances. If any one of those instances fails, the system as a whole continues to function. It's an active-active model rather than an active standby model. And if any one of those nodes runs out of capacity, you can add an additional one uh, instance of that particular type of node, and the system will automatically scale out and redistribute the load uh, while it's running. Then to close off, um, we decided to open source everything. Uh, the reason why we d decided to do that is because we want to fit into the open source ecosystem that CloudStack is, uh, as well as OpenStack. Uh, that wouldn't work as well if we were a closed source component in that environment. As I mentioned, everything is open sourced, the controller, the vRouter, same features, same scaling. Uh, the open source version provides everything that I talked about, uh, which is network virtualization, uh, the ability to apply policies, the ability to implement service chaining, the ability to connect to a uh, layer three VPN in a wide area network. Um, because we are, a, you know, we are a, a vendor of networking hardware, uh, we are very careful to build this in such a way that it works on the hardware of any vendor, but of course we also do some integration with our own physical network so that you get some additional capabilities if it's Juniper equipment. One example of that is integrated analytics, where we also generate analytics events from the physical network so that you can troubleshoot um, your, your virtual network over a physical underlay. So th thank you very much. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. What is the plugin? Uh, 
Well, we've integrated it into the, the 4.2 cloud stack, and um, we've also integrated it into the 4.3 cloud stack. All the, all the code is there. I'm, I'm not sure if we've given in a name to Duggan. And then it integrates with the uh, control controller through um, the north, northbound REST APIs that the controller uh, exposes that are consumed by that code. Yeah, so the question, to paraphrase, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Um, I, I'm not sure if I caught it entirely, but I think the question was around how do you route traffic from one isolated network, the green one, to the other isolated network, the red one, and force it through a particular sequence of virtual services? Uh, yeah, I think we have a concept in the network that can It's similar in concept, yeah. It's very similar to that concept of uh, inter VLAN routing, Al although it's implemented using overlays rather than VLANs. Okay, so do we have a VPC router that uses the overlay network VLAN? Do we have a VPC router that uses overlay networks? Does the Open Contrail plugin create a VPC router? Yes. Uh, I believe so, yes. Well, if you actually want to see it, we have a booth downstairs um, that shows the integration with OpenStack. So, sorry, with CloudStack, um, <laughs> as well. Currently, we support KVM and uh, Zen Server, and uh, ESXi support will come in Q1 of 14, and uh, Hyper-V is on the roadmap, but not a specific date yet. Is it used in production? It is not used in production yet. We have about 20 customers that, 20 or 30 by now, that are evaluating it, and there's a couple that are close to production. The ones that are publicly announced, uh, when we announced um, Contrail, as well as the open sourcing of it. There's a video of that, and there's a couple of customers there that talk publicly about being close to deploying it. Okay, you know. <laughs>